feed them. So before we get into Genesis chapter 9, we're going to pick it up at verse 8. I do want to pray. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 9. We're going to read this in context. We had, uh, last time we met, towards the middle and end of July, we were in Genesis chapter 9. Noah had gotten off the ark. God had told Noah to be fruitful and to multiply. He gave him green plants for food. He then gave him meat for food. Um, God was very direct with Noah in telling Noah not to eat animals with the blood or the life still in it. He talked about requiring life when life was taken by murder. And we left off right around there where God had told Noah to be fruitful and multiply and to take dominion of the earth just as he had told Adam and Eve to do. Because now this is the restart. This is eight people getting off an ark, beginning society once again. And this is the place where we are when we pick it up at verse 8. So I'm going to be using the English Standard Version, but you can follow me along in whatever version you have. So Genesis chapter 9, verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I've set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And now I want to go one more section here with you. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers." He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. And after the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years. And then Noah died. Dear Lord Jesus, we come before you tonight. And we come with highest expectations because we are coming to the table of the living word of God. We are coming by the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for our salvation, for our wisdom, for our righteousness, for our understanding. We come depending on the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God, who I can sense is in this room with me and who I know and sense is wherever people have tuned in. We have gathered in Jesus' name and I am praying for the power of God to be upon us. I'm praying that those who have joined young or old, whether you've ever been a part of Genesis Bible study before or not, I'm praying that each one would understand something. 
Bible studies, when they're done by the power of the Holy Spirit, with an attitude toward Jesus Christ, are never boring. Hallelujah. This is miracle time. And God, we want to agree in prayer together for every person watching, whatever their needs may be, and especially this evening for Caitlin or any other who is reaching out to you and saying, help me, God, I want to be saved. Reveal yourself to these. You are the one, God, who made the promise that if we seek you, we will find you when we seek you with all of our hearts. And Lord, we're seeking you tonight. We need you. The world is a mess. Our country is a mess. We are a mess. But we look to Jesus. Hallelujah. The author and finisher of our faith. Show us what you want to show us through the word of God this evening. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So here we are in the wonderful book of Genesis, which, as I shared with the group of young people last night, is not mythological. It's not a bunch of made-up stories just, just to show you things about God. The book of Genesis is historical truth. This is fact. We're studying the narrative that God has recorded for us by his Holy Spirit through his servant, Noah. Book of Genesis was probably recorded around 1500 BC by the hand of Noah who received from God everything that he was to write. So here we are in Genesis chapter 9, beginning at verse 8. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark is for every beast of the earth. Interesting that God not only makes covenant with people, he made this covenant with the beasts, the domesticated animals, the wild animals, the birds of the air. God has this covenant. And, and it shouldn't surprise us because the Bible is very clear in the New Testament to tell us that God even sees the sparrow that falls to the ground and he is aware of all creatures that he has made. So he establishes this covenant. Now, he's very clear to tell Noah, I recognize that you and seven other people are the only ones alive on the face of the earth. Noah, his wife, his sons, and his son's wives. But he says, I want you to know that this covenant is going to be for all the offspring that come after you. And we're going to cover a lot of topics here between tonight and next week. Let me tell you, we're going to, we're going to cover rainbows. We're going to cover drunkenness. We're going to cover Christians who sin. And we're going to get to race. We're going to talk about race. But I want to pause right here to say this. God made his covenant with everyone who would come after Noah. And I got news for you. If you're living and breathing on the face of the earth today, you've come from Noah and his family. We all originate back to Noah and his wife. Does that make sense? We're all unified. And this covenant was to Noah and his family and all of his offspring. It includes all of the human race. God said, with every living creature I make this covenant. Even the livestock, even the cattle of the field. Even the birds that fly in the sky, even the wild creatures, the lions, the, the, the serpents, all the animals that were on the ark, God said, I established this covenant, which I think is exciting, okay? And I know it's exciting to a lot of people to know that all of God's creatures are included in this covenant until the time of the millennial reign of Christ. That's exciting stuff. And I know it is on a lot of people's minds because as I am I'm on TikTok, I'm going to be working on a big, there's a big uh, video that will come sometime soon because I think maybe the second or third most asked question of young people on TikTok is, will my pets be in heaven? Okay, people are concerned and care about animals. It's exciting to know that God made this covenant even with the animals and included them in a covenant that is going to, be in place until Jesus comes back and sets up shop on the face of the earth and reigns for a thousand years, the millennial reign of Christ. I don't have time to dive completely into the millennial reign of Christ, but I just want you to know that after the time of the tribulation, we have the rapture, seven years of tribulation, we return with Christ 
to win the battle of Armageddon and to set up the millennial kingdom with Jesus. Jesus will come and reign literally on this earth, this old earth, for a thousand years. And he'll reign from Jerusalem. And it's exciting to know that when the Bible speaks about that 1,000 year reign of Christ, it mentions the animals. Uh, some of you heard me talk about this before, but it excites people. So let's just go there to Isaiah chapter 11. And you can make a note in your Bible that Isaiah chapter 11 is a chapter concerning the millennial reign of Christ. And, and know this, whatever is true of the thousand year reign of Christ on this old broken earth is definitely true of the eternal new heaven and new earth that will follow that millennial kingdom. You know, even more so true. So here's what the Bible says in Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them. I try to picture, you know, a little child doesn't even need a leash. Leading, you know, a lamb and a leopard down the street. That's what it's going to be like. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of a cobra. Can you even imagine this? Because no one will hurt or destroy on my holy mountain when the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Unbelievable but beautiful truth. God means what he says. You can turn to the New Testament. We can go to the book of Romans chapter 8, which is, of course, is a beautiful chapter, but talks a lot about the coming uh, redemption of all of creation. And in Romans 8.22, the Bible says, we know that even now the whole creation is groaning together in the pains of childbirth. I'm going to um, back it up to verse 21. The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. There's a day coming when all of creation will rejoice in us becoming who we were always meant to be with new and glorified bodies unable to sin hallelujah and then turn with me to isaiah 55 12 and 13 you're going to find this a beautiful scripture and i hope that you will you know the, we're in the days here in uh, in the united states the eastern united states we're in the kind of weather where you can still go out and you can see the, the trees and the mountains, and we can still be out in the nice weather. And I want you to think of this when you're outside, Isaiah 55, 12 and 13. Listen to what the Bible says. There's coming a day, speaking of the millennial reign of Christ, you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. How many of you have ever heard that verse before? That applies to the millennial reign of Christ. And what that verse is saying is, it is if the entire creation will enter into a symphony of joy to watch Christians not sin anymore because we're in our new and glorified bodies, to watch us enjoy what Jesus has paid for, an undying body. The mountains and the hills will sing. The trees of the field will clap their hands. And instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall never be cut off. So when God makes this promise, when he says, I'm going to establish this covenant, and I mean business by this, he is going to carry over his redemption, his promises not only to us, but to the creation, to the animal kingdom, to the mountains, to the trees. All of creation is groaning and waiting to be remade. Christianity is so huge. I remember a day when, you know, you talk to people and, and the only thing that they can ever really say about Christianity is Jesus saves your soul and someday you'll be deposited into a place called heaven. People didn't even know what, what heaven was like. Did you float on a cloud? Do you have a body? 
And I was so relieved the day God started revealing himself to me and started leading me to his scripture and resources to show me that his plan includes everything, includes the whole universe. We need to tell our young people this. This is exciting. God's taking everything over one day. He's going to save and redeem all of creation. Of course, you know, inanimate objects, uh, I mean, living things like trees and plants and animals. The redemption is a little bit different there, but we have souls, we have relationship with them, but all of creation is going to be made new. Hallelujah. And we will enjoy it. So back to Genesis chapter 9, God reiterates, he says, Noah, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. That was the promise. No flood again. I mean, after what Noah had seen, he was probably so relieved when God said never again, right? So relieved. He said specifically, this will never happen by the waters of the flood. There'll never be a flood to destroy the earth. And that's a great relief to Noah. But if you sit under my teaching, you should be able to answer this question, right? The earth will never be destroyed again by water. But the earth as we know it one day will be destroyed and remade. By what substance? Fire, right? It's going to be remade by fire. The references for this I'm going to give to you the next and final time God judges the earth. And I say final because that will be it. He will remake the earth the next time he does that. And that will be after his millennial reign. As wonderful as the millennial reign will be. God is going to put down a final rebellion of Satan after that and usher in the new heaven and the new earth wherein the sin curse will never exist and no one can ever rebel again because Satan will be cast into the lake of eternal fire. Can I get an amen? Satan and every one of his minions and every person who chose Satan over God cast away into the lake of eternal fire. New heaven, new earth. That will happen after the millennial reign, and it will be done by fire. We've gone there many times. I'm going to put the note up there for you to look at 2 Peter 3, 7 and 10. Talk specifically about God using fire to usher in a new home of righteousness, to purge this old earth and make it right. And then I have another scripture for you on there that I don't think we've ever gone to, an Old Testament corroborating scripture. So if you have your Bibles and you can turn to the very end of the Old Testament, the last prophetic book of the Old Testament, last book of the Old Testament period, is Malachi. And if you look in Malachi chapter 4, we read something so promising, uh, and it corroborates what Peter told us about the destruction of the world in a final sense by fire. The prophet Malachi said in Malachi chapter 4 verse 1, For behold, the day is coming... Listen to this, burning like an oven when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. If you can pound on your own chest and say, I don't need God. I'm just, I don't need God. I don't want anything to do with him. Arrogant. If you're a part of evil doing and you know it and you're just in willful rebellion, I would heed this, this, this scripture here. The day is coming burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. You hear that? Total destruction of evil. Leave them neither root nor branch. Evildoers will not touch the new heavens and new earth. Satan and all who follow him will be in the lake of eternal fire. Verse 2, but for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings, and you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Is that a beautiful image or what? You picture young cows just raring to get out of the stall, and you'll go out leaping into the field like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. So I would encourage young people out there, you may be mocked, you may be ridiculed, you may be made fun of for what you believe. 
But the Bible says that there is coming a day that when those who have fear of the Lord, who live under an honest, reverent fear of the Lord, you're going to shine. Hallelujah. And you are going to have your day of joy when evil is trampled. That's a promise. Okay? So we go back to Genesis. Again, just cooperating the scriptures here, bringing it all together as one. Now, in verse 12, God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you, Noah, and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. This applies to you if you're watching, right? I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. I can't get too direct about this. I can't get direct enough. I can't get excited enough about it. We take so much for granted. We just honestly do. We take so many of the things that God has shown us for granted. Last night in that small group outdoors, you know, with uh, uh, these young people, one of them uh, said to me, uh, we're talking about general revelation, the difference between special revelation, which is the Bible and Jesus, and the general revelation of God, which is the natural creation. Man, there, according to Romans 1, nobody has an excuse for not coming to God in one shape or form because of the creation. And I just want to encourage you that every time you actually see a rainbow, don't take that for granted. Every rainbow that happens is a direct act of God and a repeat of the promise that he made. That's not some kid's story that we read. This is God Almighty speaking. Do you see this? And, and I'll tell you what, right after I had studied this and prepped for this about a week ago, a storm rolled in to, near my home. And right afterwards, I went outside in the still rain. It was still raining. I went outside to look at the rainbow and to enjoy that thing with new meaning and to realize that the God of the Bible actually said, Shelly, you are one of the people I've made this covenant with. When you see the bow, I want you to remember that it's a sign of the covenant between me and the rest of the earth. That I'm not going to bring judgment again as a whole until Jesus comes back and I judge the earth by fire. And that's, that's a great promise. As bad as things may get, I know what's coming, and I know that God has it all under control. Henry Morris said of this, and again, Henry Morris is a scientist and also a theologian. He said, there would be many devastating local floods, continuing earthquakes and volcanism, cold winters, and even a long ice age, and many other disturbances in the physical earth, all a part of the residual catastrophism. In other words, what Henry Morris is saying, you know, God said this to Noah because God knew that Noah was going to see that in the coming days and months and years, and for us centuries, millennial uh, uh, periods of time, we were going to continue to see natural disasters, right? Those were all going to continue to happen. But over and over again, after a period of such storms and convulsions, they would see the beautiful rainbow traversing the heavens. And remember that God was still on his throne and the world was safe from destruction in the final sense until it's God's day of ultimate judgment. And so do not take the rainbow for granted. Look up in the sky and say, oh, there's a rainbow. Oh, that's just a random collection of water droplets and the sun happened. Listen. Yes, there's natural explanation for it, but there's a God behind the natural phenomenon who's in charge of the natural order. And he is speaking through that rainbow and repeating a promise. Warren Wearsby said, rainbows are caused by the sunlight filtering through the water in the air, each drop effectively becoming a prism to release the colors hidden in the white light of the sun. Do you realize that? So the white light of the sun shines forth, and a rainbow, what it does is it uses each drop of water, each drop of rain, as a little prism to reflect the colors. Rainbows are fragile but beautiful, and nobody has to pay to see them. Isn't it amazing the government hasn't found some way to charge us to look at a rainbow? 
Their lovely colors speak to us of what Peter called the manifold grace of God. In other words, the varied grace of God. You know, in that, in that text in 1 Peter chapter 4, it's talking about different gifts that God gives the people. God has made us all with different giftings. He's given us different graces to serve him. And the rainbow reflects that with its varied colors. The Greek word translated manifold means various, many colored, variegated. The rainbow reminds us of God's gracious covenant and the many colored grace of God. Amen? How many of you are thankful that God knows you exactly as you are and he has tailored his grace to meet every one of your strengths and your weaknesses the way that he has made you to be. That's beautiful. In verse 14, when I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. It feels like God is repetitive here and he keeps repeating the same thing over in different phrases and ways to Noah. But I guess Noah needed to hear it, right? You talk about PTSD. You think Noah had post-traumatic stress syndrome after what he had seen? After he had seen the whole world die and been through that flood and on that ark? And God was just reiterating the promise. But this is, it, it, it's so interesting. Um, when the bow is seen in the clouds, let's look again at what Henry Morris said. He said, the rainbow demonstrates most gloriously the grace of God. The pure white light from the unapproachable holiness of his throne is refracted, as it were, through the glory clouds surrounding his presence, breaking into all the glorious colors of God's creation. In wrath, he remembers mercy. The glory follows the sufferings, right? The rainbow follows the storm. The rainbow comes after the rain has moved through and the sun begins to shine. Grace and mercy follows wrath. And where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I don't always like to see the droplets of rain. I don't always want a rainstorm to happen. I got to take all my lawn cushions and put them in and, you know, you got to do it. But listen, when it rains, all the water droplets help to form the rainbow. And I'm here to tell you that God in his mercy... Hallelujah. His mercy is greater than all our sin. Isn't that beautiful to think about? And where sin it bounds, grace shows up. When the bow is in the clouds, God said, I will see it and remember. Isn't that interesting? Did you ever think about it? It's not God saying, you know, not only do I want you to know this, Noah, that when you see the rainbow, here's the promise I've made. God says, whenever the rainbow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember. I can almost be moved to tears right now because I'm just thinking to myself, you go, next time you have a chance to go out and look at a rainbow in real life, go look at it. And as your eyes are meeting that rainbow, I want you to think that your God in heaven, his eyes are also meeting that rainbow. And in that very moment, God is remembering his everlasting covenant. And you know why that's so beautiful to me? The world is as wicked as it was in the days of Noah. I mean, it's building up to that, the Bible says, by the end times. We deserve that judgment and that wrath. But we're not getting it because God's made a promise. And every time he sees the rainbow, he reminds himself of the promise. That is a beautiful, beautiful thing to think about. His mercy that he has shown us between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God and every living creature. You know, what could possibly be the thoughts of God concerning the subject of worldwide judgment? In other words, when God says, I will see it and I'll remember the covenant that I made never to do this again, when God sees the rainbow in the clouds and he's reminded of his covenant, what is he thinking concerning that worldwide judgment? 
What is he remembering about what happened in the days of Noah? And what is he thinking about the coming judgment by fire? Can you pause with me for just a minute? Can we think broadly and deeply from God's perspective here? Every time the rainbow appears in the clouds, God sees the rainbow and remembers what he did in Noah's day. True? And not only does he do that, but he remembers that he's promised not to judge again until the judgment by fire. True? And when God thinks of that coming judgment in the future and he thinks of the judgment in the past, what are his thoughts, I wonder? What goes through his mind? We know one thing. God's not stuck in time. Before Noah, well, before all the people in Noah's day ever sinned, let me ask you a question. Before all the people in Noah's day ever got so evil that God had to bring the flood, did God know they were going to be evil like that? Before God ever made Adam and Eve and put them in the garden, did God know Adam and Eve were going to sin? Yes, he did. The Bible is clear. When did God make a plan to save us from our sin? After Adam and Eve sinned, did God say, oops, whoa, what am I going to do now? Better get a plan in place. After things got so bad in Noah's day, did God say, whoa, what is going on here? I better think of something. As the, as the Antichrist, the times of the Antichrist, we're moving swiftly into that whole thing and everything in the world is getting so crazy as God's saying, whoa, what are we going to do? No. The Bible is 100% clear that from eternity past, listen, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have loved one another and been in perfect unity and worked together way before the universe was ever made. Way before the universe was ever created. And the Bible says that it was then that the three came into agreement that Jesus would take on flesh and come to the earth and save us from our sin. Hallelujah. The eternal plan of God. So I want you to think deeply about something. I have a picture of a rainbow here. I'm hoping you can see it. But you know that rainbows are called a bow because it's in the shape of a bow. Right? It's, a, it's just this curved feature that we see in the sky. Sometimes you can see kind of the whole thing from end to end. But I want you to picture an archer with a bow. This rainbow could have an arrow right here, couldn't it? The arrow would be here and it would be ready to be shot through the string. John Phillips said, What a beautiful symbol the rainbow is. Its arch is bent like a bow toward heaven, but it is a bow without an arrow because the arrow has already been spent. Let that sink in for a minute. Just let it sink in. It's a beautiful symbol because its arch is bent like a bow toward heaven, but it is a bow without an arrow because the arrow has already been spent, it's already been used. Picture this, you got your rainbow. All right, there's no arrow here. That's where it would go. Do you know why the arrow isn't there? Because God already launched the arrow at his own son. The arrow of judgment already flew at Jesus Christ the Son when he died on the cross for our sins and suffered on our behalf. The arrow is no longer there. Warren Wearsby said it this way, a bow is an instrument of war, but God has transformed it into a picture of his grace and faithfulness, a guarantee of peace. God could certainly turn the bow of judgment upon us because we've broken his law and deserve judgment. But he has turned the bow toward heaven and taken the punishment on himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at that. Look at the picture of the rainbow again. The bow goes towards heaven, not towards earth. Because when God chose to pay for our sin, he put it toward heaven on his own son. 
Even back in Noah's day, God was looking at that rainbow thinking, my son is coming. He's going to pay for man's sin. That is where judgment hits. And praise God, this bow is not inverted with the arrow of God's judgment coming down on Shelley Prindle, which is what it deserves to do. But in God's mercy, he has spent that arrow on Jesus Christ. Verse 17, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And when I read that, I got to tell you, I thought about something. How many of you have ever made a really good promise to even one person and kept it completely? Try and make a promise to one person over a long period of time. How many of you have made a promise to a group of people and have been able to keep it? God Almighty, I put in my notes, wow, God who is infinite in nature can viably make a promise between himself and everything and everyone living and actually keep the promise. God is faithful. He's the only one who could say that. I'm going to make a promise between myself and everybody, and I'm going to keep it. And God did. Now, before we move on to verse 18 about the sons of Noah and Noah's drunkenness, I know that the rainbow has been abused and misused in our culture today. But instead of getting angry about that, I want us to really remember the rainbow for what it is. And you can even use it as a conversation starter to say that no matter what the sin struggle is, no matter what judgment is deserved for any particular sin, that arrow was launched at Jesus Christ to set us free. Hallelujah. Beautiful, beautiful conversation piece. Okay, now we're going to get to some tough stuff here. We're going to get to our man, Noah. If you remember when we first started talking about Noah and where the Bible said that God was going to destroy the whole earth, but he spared Noah, I always say to people, why did God spare Noah? Did he spare him because he was a perfect man, right? And the answer is no. A lot of people are convinced of that, but I love the fact that God is brutally honest with us, and he doesn't say, there's, he doesn't have much negative to say about Noah, but he does leave this account in the scripture to show us, if we ever had a doubt, that there is no one righteous, no, not one. There is not a perfect man or woman on the face of the earth save Jesus Christ the Son. Amen? And so we're going to see a blot on Noah's record here. But it's, it's so important for us to read and study, as I'm going to show you. So Genesis 9, verse 18. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now Ham was the father of Canaan. Notice God inserts that right there. He, he says something particular about Ham. He wants us to know, by the way, Ham was the father of Canaan. Any of you who have experience with the Bible know the word Canaan. And you're probably thinking to yourself, Canaan, the Canaanites, those were the enemies of Israel, right? When God sent Israel to the promised land, the Canaanites were the ones that God said, get them out of there because they are ungodly and they are wicked and they are going to cause you to be drawn away from me. So very interesting, God tells us right away, he connects this son of Noah, Ham, to his son Canaan. In this particular narrative, as you're going to see, we're going to learn why. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. So we can all trace our lineage back to Noah and his wife and back to either Shem, Ham, or Japheth. John Calvin said, We observe how effective God's blessing became as so many people grew from one family. One little family grew into many nations. Remember what God said when he blessed Noah? He said, be fruitful and multiply. I have no time of day for disunity among humanity. We are all related. We all trace ourselves back to one family. Henry Morris said this, all the physical characteristics of the different nations and tribes 
must therefore have been present in the genetic constitutions of these six people who came through the flood of the ark. Isn't that a profound thought? You think of all the genetic differences. You think of the different looks and statures and makeup of so many different people in different tribes and nations, and you realize that all those genetic differences trace back to just six people. Noah's sons and their wives. Somehow, by the regular mechanisms of genetics, variation, recombination, all the various groups of nations and tribes must have developed from this beginning. Listen, it's high time we get back into the Bible. It's high time we make sure our kids know this is not fairy tale. We're talking real history and science here. This would solve a lot of our current issues if people would actually believe this and people would actually live by this. I hope you're feeling that tonight. Because we've got a lot of cultural issues happening in our world today. And we need to approach it from the Bible's perspective. Acts chapter 17, to corroborate the Old Testament here, one of my favorite scriptures. And he, God, made from one man. Now, you may have a different version of the Bible. And some versions of the Bible might say blood here. Okay? He made from one man, or the Greek word behind that could even be uh, translated blood. He made from one man or one blood every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Hallelujah. So this scripture corroborates, this scripture in Acts, written by Dr. Luke, corroborates for us what Genesis is saying. God made from one man, Adam, and then narrowed down or funneled down again from Noah and his wife, every nation of mankind. And then God said, you're coming from one blood, genetically, but I am going to determine all the places, the boundaries and the places and the time in which you're going to live, which shows that God is sovereign over where you were born, where you live now, and when you were born. Amen? And he knows the reasons why. And you might say, why did God allow me to be born in America at the time that I was? Why did God allow that person to be born in that remote country over there in the Middle East or in Africa in the time that they... Why does God do that? Well, God knows that according to who we are, our genetic makeup, our proclivities, our personalities, he puts us where he puts us knowing that that would be the best place for us to seek God. It would be the best opportunity for us to find him. I can't explain that in every situation, but I stand on the word of God to tell you that. Okay? Now, again, the emphasis here, you got the three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. God emphasizes that Ham was the father of Canaan. The importance of this statement will come to light soon enough. The Canaanites became one of the Israelites' worst enemies. Okay, so God is showing us there. There's something about Ham and his son Canaan and all of the progeny of Ham and Canaan are going to become, oh, wow, they're going to throw a wrench into the Israelites' journey with the Lord. That we know. John Phillips said, the fact that Ham was the father of the Canaanites was of prime interest to Israel since it was that accursed race that opposed their entry into the promised land, right? When God told them, I'm bringing you out of Egypt, I'm bringing you out of bondage, I'm taking you to the promised land, the Canaanites were the primary problem in that place. Genesis 9, 20, Noah began to be a man of the soil. He gets out of the ark. You know, he did a... You know, you, we could say he was pretty much a carpenter for about 100 years before the flood, right? He was into carpentry. And now he must have a home, a shelter built. And the Bible says that he became a man of the soil. Uh, some versions say a husbandman or he became, you know, a gardener. And he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. This is just pretty raw. You know, this is Noah. This is our man Noah. This is the righteous man that God said of everybody on the face of the earth. This is the one I choose to be saved. You say, Shelly, how could that be? Did he really get drunk? And, and I had a great opportunity, like I said last night at our small group.
group, one of the one of the young adults, young ladies, she looked at me. She, you know, I've been bothered by that. I've been trying to read through the Bible chronologically, and I, I got to ask you, Shelley, why in the world was was Noah naked? <laughs> okay. And okay, let's have a little bit, of, have a little bit of laugh with this. I, I said, well, Noah was naked. I mean, because he was drunk. I said. And I said to all the young people sitting there, do you ever think that happens? Do people ever get completely drunk and then they end up naked? Okay. Yeah, let's just, the Bible speaks to the reality of life and the reality of sin. Okay, so this scripture is showing you so clearly that what saved Noah was the grace of God. Amen. You can be the baddest dude around. And the grace of God will still apply to you when you believe God. See, that's what I emphasized to those kids last night. Here's the deal. Noah was not perfect, but you know what Noah did? He took God at his word. That doesn't mean he wasn't a sinner, but he believed God. When nobody else believed God who said, I'm going to send a flood, you got to build an ark. Trust me on this. When nobody else believed God sight unseen, Noah took God at his word. Doesn't mean he wasn't a sinner, but he believed the Lord. Hallelujah. Listen to me. Being a Christian in this world, in heaven we won't, and things should get better as we progress, but being a Christian in this world does not mean you never sin. It means you take God at his word. Hallelujah. So let's let's just watch this. Noah began to be a man of soil. He planted a vineyard. We don't know how much time has elapsed here between him getting off the ark, planting the vineyard, and uh, drinking a lot of the wine, all right, enough to get drunk. Uh, he drank of the wine, he became drunk, and he lay naked in his tent. Rough stuff. I wrote down in my notes, I can think of no verse more fitting to follow this devastating scripture but this verse. This is the verse that comes to my mind. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. All you good Christians out there, let's listen. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. You hear that? Let anybody who thinks they've got it all together pay attention. Because just when you think you're better than the next man or woman, or better than the next teenager, just when you think you got it all together, you've got some special blessing from God that you can never fall, you're just about to fall, right? Because the Bible also says pride comes before a downfall. Now, we're not told that Noah was proud here, but I'm just telling you, this is an important scripture to remember. I speak from experience in telling you that it is after your greatest spiritual victories that you are most apt to fall and tumble into some type of sin. Okay? You get on a spiritual high, you have a big spiritual victory, an enemy comes rushing in, you're tired from the battle, and you can fall into sin. Uh, we don't know what, how much time transpired here, but that's an important verse to remember. Henry Morris. The tragic story of Noah's drunkenness and the sudden unveiling of Ham's rebellious heart provides graphic evidence that, despite the cleansing judgment of the flood, man was still a sinner, and Satan was still the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience. Ephesians 2.2. 2. Look that scripture up this week. Satan is the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. If you don't belong to Jesus Christ, if you're disobedient to the Lord, that power is at work within you. I wrote down in my notes how true is 1 Peter 5.8. 1 Peter 5.8. Let's just turn there for a moment. This should be uh, a memory verse for everyone. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. You've heard this about the roaring lion. Be sober-minded. Interesting. I didn't even think that that verse begins with be sober-minded, okay? Noah, are you listening? Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, all right? 
It's when you're walking tight with Jesus. It's when you're effective for the kingdom of God that the enemy's really coming after you. So watch out. Watch out. What Satan, I put this in my notes too, what Satan could not do before the flood, he pulls off after the flood. Yikes. Think about that. Satan couldn't trip up Noah before the flood, but man, he took his opportunity after the flood. He sure did. Again, what I was talking about, spiritual victories. You got to be careful after a great spiritual victory because the enemy will pounce right in there. Matthew Henry, it was said of Noah that he was perfect in his generations, but this shows that it is meant of sincerity, not a sinless perfection. And I'm going to speak grace to somebody who's watching right now because I know I need to hear this and I know there are people out there that need to hear this. There are no perfect Christians in this life. I praise God that we're aiming for perfection and we're going to have his righteousness in completeness in heaven. But I want to speak grace to somebody right now. God sees your heart. And even when you mess up, even when you sin, God knows the direction of your heart. Noah was a man who was different from the people in his day, not because he was perfect, but because he was sincere in his desire to hear God and to believe God. And if you are sincere, listen to me, I don't care who you are, if you are sincere in your desire to hear God, to search out his word, to know God, to know Jesus, and to believe him, God sees that. He's not looking for perfection in you. He has perfection in his son. But he's looking for a heart that wants him. He's looking for a heart that's not hypocritical but a heart that is seeking God. Hallelujah. That's just a beautiful thing I feel the Holy Spirit wanting me to emphasize. And I want to, in line with that, turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 8 for another cooperating scripture. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. You might, this might sound familiar because Matthew 5, the beginning of that chapter, are the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount. And verse 8, Matthew 5, 8, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And a lot of you may read that scripture and think, oh no, I, I want to see God one day, but I'm not pure in heart, because a lot of people think pure in heart means perfect. But Jesus didn't say, blessed are the perfect, for they shall see God. He said, blessed are the pure in heart. What does that mean? How many of you enjoy bring, uh, drinking pure water, right? You don't want water with all kind of additives or all kind of, you know, you don't want water with a bunch of lead in it or a bunch of uh, contaminants, all right? So everybody's big on they want pure water. You buy a water filter, you get bottled water that's pure water. You know what that means? That means not mixed, not contaminated. Jesus said, blessed are those whose hearts are not contaminated by a desire to go after other things, but whose hearts are pure. In other words, all in, uncontaminated by other loves, by other desires, and want God. Amen? Be overcome. Pray for a heart that is pure. Not a heart that wants God mostly, but career a little bit too, or God mostly and this relationship a little bit too, or a person that wants God mostly, but what I desire. So no, be a person that says, God, I want a pure heart, an unmixed heart, uncontaminated heart. Not that you're a perfect person. That stuff follows. But what God's looking at is your heart. You remember how God said about David that David was a man after God's own heart? David committed adultery and murder. But he was a man after God's own heart because God saw that when David sinned, he hated that sin. He was truly repentant of that sin. But God saw that when all came down to it, David wanted 
God more than anything. It wasn't perfect, but he wanted God more than anything. I hope that that's uh, ministering to you. I know we, we only have a, a minute left here, but let me just, let me go one more step further. Sometimes those who with watchfulness and resolution have, by the grace of God, kept their integrity in the midst of temptation, have, through security and carelessness and neglect of the grace of God, been surprised into sin when the hour of temptation has been over. Listen, my friends, never let down your guard. Can I get an amen out there? Never let down your guard. I don't want to hold you longer than I promised to keep you, so we will pick it up here when we come back. And we are coming back, okay, Tuesday, August 11th, this coming Tuesday, same time, same place, 6.30 p.m. We will pick it up right here where we were, what verse were we on? Genesis 9, 20 and 21. And we will continue this discussion of Noah's drunkenness and nakedness. And I'm going to tell you what, what we see happen with Ham, Shem, and Japheth is going to show us a beautiful picture of God's mercy and how we ought to be toward one another and how we not ought, we should not be toward one another. Beautiful stuff coming up. And like I said, we'll also get into a discussion of race. Now, don't tune out because this final prayer is a very important prayer. We pray at the beginning for the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts. We dive into the actual text of the living word of God. He stirred up some things in your heart. So don't tune out for the final prayer. That's when God's going to work on those things he's just shown you. Okay? But remember, too, to join me on Sunday. Join me Sunday at 10 a.m. Because Sunday at 10 a.m. is going to be a really cool sermon. Overcoming the end times tragedy of powerless Christianity. And I want to get this, uh, this uh, slide up here, too, before I pray. Don't forget... We need you to keep doing what we're doing. I've dedicated myself to full-time ministry. That's why I can write and preach on Sundays. That's why I can write Bible studies and do them on Tuesday nights. That's why I can put out Passion Point emails. By the way, I uh, want to say this too. If you're new to the ministry, we've been drawing in a lot of new people to the ministry. If you would like a daily devotion written by me delivered to your email inbox every morning, Comment here or go to the website and hit the contact us button. Give us your email address and we will add you so that instead of having to search Facebook or TikTok, you can actually get something delivered to your email every weekday by way of devotion that I've written, okay? But I, I can only do these things because you support us financially, so pray about that. Now let's pray, okay? We're going to pray that God... We're going to ask you to take everything that we have spoken of in your word tonight, everything that has kind of been specifically, everybody's had something different impressed on their heart. And that's the beauty of it, Lord, that your Holy Spirit knows each one of us. So whatever's been stirred up in our hearts, I pray work in that this week. Cause your Holy Spirit to keep speaking to us. I pray that your people would dig into your word. And Lord, I'm praying right now for every person that said, I want to be saved. If you want to be saved, if you want to be forgiven of your sins and assured that you are right with God and going to heaven one day, then right now I'm just going to ask you to pray this prayer with me from your heart. Remember, it's all about the sincerity. From your heart, pray this prayer. Just say, dear Jesus... I believe in you. I believe in what your word says. I know I'm a sinner. I believe you took the hit for my sin. So God, please forgive me. Set me in relationship with you and help me to know you better each day until I see you in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. You are saved if you've prayed that from your heart. And all friends of Hope and Passion Ministries, I'm praying God's richest blessings over you. 
I'll see you next Tuesday evening and hopefully Sunday morning. Amen.